Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak to each one to one. I'm pleased that Norris Church Mailer is able to be with us today. Her memoir, A Ticket to the Circus, has received the kind of reviews anyone, including her late husband, Norman Mailer, dream of and covet. The book is fiercely honest, funny and touching, smart, and above all, loving. What a remarkable life you've led, from Little Miss Little Rock, to marriage to your high school boyfriend, to being a divorcee with a young child, to the chance encounter at a party in Russellville, Arkansas, that led four months later to moving to New York and living with the Norman Mailer, hence the circus. <laughs> Tell me about, you know, com coming up with that title. Oh, well, I was um, having a talk with my girlfriend, Margot Howard, who's an advice columnist, actually, and, um, you know, we were talking about how I, how I could have been so stupid and not picked up on the signs when my husband had this affair, and because he had had so many over the years. I was wife number six. I mean, you know, hello, you, you didn't think this might happen to you? And and I was like, well, no, I, I didn't really <laughs> think that because he had been so true to me all those years. And mm -hmm. I said, but I guess I bought my ticket to the circus. I don't know why I was surprised to see elephants. And, and there you go. <laughs> and both of, us, both of us said, that's a good title. That's a title. <laughs> so you came from a pretty working class childhood sure. in, down in Arkansas. Tell us, how would you describe your childhood? Oh, I had an idyllic childhood. Not many people can say that, but I was an only child. My dad did heavy construction, um, building dams and roads and stuff like that. He was a CB during the war, and my mom had a little beauty shop uh, out in our garage, the Steel Magnolia kind of beauty shop. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I got all the toys and have all the responsibility. I guess that's what only children do. Now, your father had uh, a serious accident uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the job yes, that, you did. know, disabled him to a certain extent, caused him a lot of pain for mm -hmm. much of his life. And your mother had um, uh, a problem with depression and uh, uh, rages, was it? Tell me, how did that affect you growing up? I, I, think it, I think it made me more responsible. It made me more grow up a little faster than I probably would have otherwise, mm -hmm. um, because I always felt like I, I was kind of in charge. I was the one that had to take care of things, and um, I learned to drive a car when I was eight. I mean, oh, can, really? Can I you, hope you can, weren't going very far. Well, I, you know, I went around those dirt roads around Arkansas, and nobody seemed to, I had to sit on a sofa cushion at first. Well, first I sat in my daddy's lap and learned to steer, mm -hmm. and then I went, graduated to a sofa cushion until my feet could reach the pedals, and then when I was about 11 or 12, I, I was a pretty tall girl. I was driving my mother everywhere because she couldn't drive. Okay. <laughs> so, when, you know, looking over my shoulder to see if the, the sheriff was after me, I was always terrified of getting arrested. And him was like, what, you're 12 years old? <laughs> now, your mother actually, I guess, was hospitalized, had some, underwent some shock treatments. You know, I know that the treatment of mental illness has progressed sort of mm -hmm. steadily. Do you think, um, uh, given what we know about the treatment of mental illness today, that her life would have been different if she had been in a different, this has happened later or Well, or I, I think it would. I think with the advent of drugs like Prozac and which she's on now, which has really changed her life in a lot of ways. Um, if I think she, if she'd had that when I was younger, it would have made a whole big difference in everyone's life, mm -hmm. but she didn't have that. And I don't really know what went on with the shock treatments. Um, she doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah. So you must have known from a very early age that you were a head turner. Very oh. attractive. Well, I, you, you won your first beauty pageant. Were you age three? I was three. I was Little Miss Little Rock. And it wasn't like it is now with these little girls and their wigs and their uh -huh. curly lashes and makeup. And I mean, we, it was just little girls walking out on the stage and, you know, kind of. But I got out there and I liked it. Boy, I liked that spotlight and they couldn't get me off the stage. Now, were there later beauty pageants as well? Well, a couple. I was. I, I ran for Miss Tech, Miss Arkansas Tech, okay, and got fourth runner-up, uh, which gave me the, you know, the emphasis to do it again the next year, and I didn't win the next year. So, I'm, in fact, I had the flu or something that mm -hmm. night and had to keep going off stage to throw up. So that oh, was wow. that was a very attractive. 
being so attractive, that did that give you, especially in the South where there's a lot of emphasis placed on female beauty, did that give you a sense of power or? Well, yeah, it did. You have to just, you know, you don't want to stand and shuffle your feet. Yeah, it did. I mean, people are, who are very, very smart or pretty or have, you know, outstanding attributes, I guess, use them and that's just one tool in your kit that you, if you can use it, that you know, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, so you went off to college and you married um, young mm -hmm, to your, your college sweetheart, this mm -hmm. is Larry, mm -hmm. and uh, who went into, was it the Army or the Air Force? It was the Army. Okay, yeah, okay. He was in the ROTC. Okay, and you had a son, mm -hmm. Matthew. Uh, at what point did you realize that that marriage was a mistake? Or what oh. made, and what made you realize that? I guess that? about three months after we got married. <laughs> I grew up in the Baptist church, and I don't know if anybody out there knows what that means. But I do. <laughs> <laughs> but in Arkansas, in the 50s and 60s, it meant that you sat there three times a week and got told you were going to hell if you did any little sin, like have a glass of wine or a beer, or certainly make love with your boyfriend before you got married, and that's that's exactly what we did when we were 17, and so I was on the road to hell if I didn't marry this guy. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he was on the way to Vietnam, which was kind of a road to hell itself. So I, I kind of talked him into marrying me, and I don't know why he did. I don't think he really much wanted to, but I don't know. He did. He married me, and um, he did go to Vietnam, and two weeks before he left for Vietnam, I got pregnant and had my son while he was, or our son while he was over there. Um, and it was just, it was just hard. I had been dating him since I was 16. I never really dated anyone else, certainly never slept with anyone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I began to realize when we started living together that I didn't know him at all. He was a, a different person than I knew. The, the cute football player was um, turned into a nuclear engineer. I mean, mm -hmm. he was very interested in science and I was an artist and I was hanging out with the hippie crowd at school. and. He thought my whole career was just playing, and we we are we were just polar opposites. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just realized I'm 20 years old, 21 years old, and I I just don't want to live my life this way. Like my like a lot of people did. They you got married, you made your bed, you laid in it. You know, you didn't uh, you didn't look back. Fifty like, years later, right? Like, like my parents. So you were you're how old when you two split up? I was 24. Okay. So there you are, you're in, living in Russellville, Arkansas, mm -hmm. you're teaching art, mm -hmm. you're doing art, mm -hmm. uh, you're divorced with a young son. What kind of life were you imagining for yourself at that point in time? Oh, I was going to go back to school and get my master's and teach in college. That would have been a great life for me. Mm -hmm. I was, I, and you were very happy. I was happy. I, I didn't leave because I was unhappy. I loved Arkansas. I loved teaching. I liked, I loved art. I liked all the stuff I was doing. You know, we'd go to... Um, craft shows and I'd do your pencil portrait sitting here for five dollars and I had a lot of friends who were potters and painters and you know we just it was a great life. And somewhere along the way you met um, Bill Clinton. I, I did. And had a little romance. Had How little did that romance. happen and what was that like? Oh my gosh. Um, it's been way blown out of proportion. He was he was cute. He was running for Congress. He was 27. Uh, somebody invited me to a fundraiser for him and uh, walked in the door and he was up there talking and you know, you know how charismatic he yes, is. Yes, I, I do. Mean, he's just, so um, I started, he wanted to know if I wanted to work in the campaign. So I, I didn't really because I didn't really want to work in the campaign. I just wanted to see him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I got involved with that for a few months one summer and uh, he, was, he was sweet and I liked him. I still like him. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he's, still friends? We're still friends okay. to, to a degree. Then you went to a book party one night that changed your life. Tell me about yeah. that. Um, well, I had to coerce myself into this party because Francis Galtney, who was my, my friend and teacher, um, was old friends with Norman Mailer and they'd been in the war together. And um, they got together every two or three years when they were traveling around, if Norman was going to you know, give a lecture or something. So this is one of those things where you know, ten things have to line up in a row in order for something to happen. And they all lined up because I had just gotten Marilyn the book of the, from the book of the month, which I would never have gone out and bought because it was $20 and I would never have spent that much on a book. 
but that came in the mail and I read it and kind of liked it and um, was you know I was thought myself a writer too I was I was taking creative writing and although I was a painter I thought I could I could write as well and wanted to do that and so I wanted to get my book signed and meet this famous writer I would never meet another famous writer in my life and so I called up Francis and said, can I come over and meet Norman Mailer and maybe get my book signed? And he said, hell no, I'm not going to bother Norman with that fan crap. He was really upset. <laughs> and, uh, it seems a little strange because it was a book party, right? Well, it, no, was, it wasn't a book party. It was just a party for Norman. Oh, I see. No, I see. No, okay. he, he, uh, no, he wasn't pushing a book. Oh, okay. He was just, it was just a... Okay. And he'd invited his friends and the English faculty. They were all dressed up, you know, like we are today in our little suits. And so you talked yourself into going. So, I, so finally he said I could come. And I thought, well, I'll just run in and, you know, see how the wind's blowing, get my book signed, and run, run back out. And I, I don't even change. I'm wearing blue jeans, you know, little hip huggers, and my shirt tied like this, and long, long hair. And I'll walk in the door, and, the, and these big sandals that make me about six feet three. And walk in the door, and... He's wearing jeans, the most patched jeans I've ever seen in my life. They were just patches on top of patches, and everybody else was all dressed up. And he gets up across the room and walks across, like in the slow motion thing. Mm -hmm. And he came over and stuck out his hand and introduced himself, and then he turned around and walked out of the room. And uh, I was like, well, I guess he hates tall women. And then he had sent Francis over to invite me to dinner. And I said, oh, Francis, I don't think that's a very good idea. I don't think Mr. Mayo liked me much. And Francis said, likes you hell. He's the one who wants you to go. I don't want you to go. He was really being so bad to me that mm -hmm. night. Um, but I went, and um, I guess the rest is history. There was a, a, a big attraction. There was a big attraction. Uh huh. It was, and I, I guess I'd never really had that love at first sight thing. It wasn't really love at first sight. It was intrigue at first sight, mm -hmm. or it was, you know, wild interest or something. I've just never met anybody like him. He had the craziest brain. I mean, he knew something about everything and he was just endlessly fascinating. And that's is, what, it, was that what attracted you to yeah. his intellect and? Mm -hmm. It was. Now he's uh, twice your age. Yeah, he's, he was then. <laughs> he was, he was twice, you were 26, he was 52. Right. Uh, he was still married to his fifth wife. He had at least, I, I know at least one, maybe two uh, well, he was, he was actually still married to his fourth wife. Oh, really? But he'd been living with another woman who became his fifth wife. I see. For five years, and they had a daughter who was four or five. And, uh, and he had two or three serious girlfriends on the side. Right. One of whom was pressuring him to leave all of them for her. And um, it was a mess. And here, wow. I, here I am just kind of moving into it. No, no, no. <laughs> well... We're going to take a short break for the following message, and then we're going to come, be back with more with Norris Church Mailer and find out the next <laughs> part of the story, author of A Ticket to the Circus. It's just been published by Random House. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Norris Church Mailer, author of A Ticket to the Circus, a memoir just published by Random House. So you and Norman start this correspondence, you get together in Chicago, you get together in New York, mm -hmm. and then you decide you're gonna pick up with your seven-year-old son and you're going to move to New York. Mm -hmm. um, what were you thinking? I guess I wasn't thinking very much, was I? I was thinking that uh, I could do anything I, I could do. I felt pretty sure of myself. I could teach. I could get a job doing something. I was supporting myself already. I didn't get child support from my husband and was already supporting my, my son, who was actually three at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt like I could take care of myself, and if this didn't work out, I'd do something else. And I'd always wanted to be a model when I was a teenager. I used to model for the Log Cabin Democrat okay. um, in Arkansas doing pictures of you know, clothes and stuff for the local newspaper. And you were not intimidated by this history, this complicated family history? You know, I, I wasn't, and I don't really know why. I think it's because I, I think it was being being so confident in my love with, from my family, 
because if you get that when you're growing up, it just doesn't go away because you move someplace else. Um, you always have that feeling that you're loved and that you can accomplish anything you want to do. How did your, your parents respond to when oh. you told them? Well, they were half killed. I mean, it was horrible. Their, their only daughter was taking their only grandson and moving to New York to this horrible place and with this man who'd been, um, you know, pleased. They were just, they, they, they finally had to get over it. They didn't mm -hmm. have a choice because they finally saw that I wasn't going to come back. But for years, my father would call me up and say, well, there's a little house on sale, you know, down the street from us. Should I get it for you? And <laughs> you think you might want to just have it come just back, in case? Come home. Yeah. You always come home. Once you got to New York, um, you were almost immediately hired, it seemed, as a model by one of the leading modeling agencies. Yeah. What was that like for a girl who had always won, worn polyester? I know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was... You know, it's just like you run down the street and you click your heels. You can't believe it. It's, uh, it was just a dream come true. I never got to be a big model, but um, I had fun doing it. I, um, you know, I, I couldn't really travel. I had the family. Right. And, uh, I couldn't pack up and go to Europe for a year, which is what they wanted me right, to do. That's right. what they usually do to the, for the new girls. And I do all the things that really you have to do. And, you, and I should have been younger. I, now, was it one of Norman's friends who, who hooked you up with the, um, with the, the modeling agency? Yeah, Amy Green called, okay. called Wilhelmina and got, okay. me, got me the, uh, the interview. Despite uh, Norman's large and complicated family life, it seemed that the integration of you and your child into with him and his children and even the mothers of his children seemed to have been relatively smooth. Was it smooth? It was, and you know, people just are boggled by that. But I think by the time I came along, the, his life was, the, the kids were in such shock from all these women back and forth and in and out. And, you know, he would stay with one two years and one three years, and then there'd be another kid and I mean it was just the kids were sort of jerked back and forth and I was um, I was a kid and I was the oldest one was my age and we mm -hmm. played we had fun we'd mm -hmm. go to movies and we'd go out in the yard and play ball and we'd you know we just were I was sort of like their sister but at the same time I was not a not their mother exactly I never the, the younger ones more of a mother figure I guess right. but but um, were there any conflicts with any of the wives or girlfriends? Oh, sure. Well, the girlfriends I didn't interact with much. Uh, the wives, some were my fr were my friends. Some are my friends now. Um, some were never my friends and never would be. Uh, they, you know, there was five of them, so they, you, you know, things change over the years. Um, one that I thought I'd never be friends with is one of my dear friends now. Which so, one is that? Uh, Carol. Okay. Maggie's okay. Married, yeah. Tell me about your adjustment to New York City and to Norman's huge circle of friends, uh, which sounded like um, a whirlwind of parties, social mm -hmm. engagements, cultural events, with a whole lot of famous and accomplished people. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it was, it, I was just sort of like dropped in there and, it, you know, it was okay. I was, this was, these are the people he knew and uh, I think it would have been the same no matter what he had done, who, whatever his friends were. I would have, you know, tried to get to like them and know them, and uh, and I wasn't really intimidated. I just, I guess, too stupid to be. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so Norman was widely viewed by people, certainly in the in the women's movement at the time, yeah. as a sexist pig. Yeah, he was not popular. No, he uh, wasn't. Was he? No, he was not a sexist pig. He said some stupid things. He he thought he was funny. He had a very strange sense of humor. Like, uh, you know, his remark to, I think it was Orson Welles, of, of Orson, you know women should be kept in cages. You know, I mean, would anybody think that was a serious remark? There's still, they still quote him on that remark with him really making out like he was thinking women should be put in cages. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. And he certainly thought women should have the same rights as men and the same salary as men and he was you know for women's right to choose I mean he you know he was good on all that stuff he he did you know I mean he liked to jerk chains and he liked to cause controversy and he um, and they liked it too so you know he went head to head with a few of them like Town Bloody Hall with you know Jermaine Greer and you know all about that I'm sure. Do you think he but, I mean you know when I when I read about you know his his life I mean, it, it seems sort of like shades of uh, of Ernest Hemingway yeah with a sort of a macho man and with you know a mm. writer and 
lots of women. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think he thought of himself in that vein? Oh, yeah. He, yeah. he admired Hemingway, yeah. It's always, who is the next Hemingway? Mm -hmm. Who is better than Hemingway? Am, am I better? Is he better? And You know, I, I don't know. I don't know if other writers think that way. I never thought in terms of better than. I don't think I'm a better writer than anybody else. And I, you know, it's just what we do is so different. Yeah, I think men are pretty competitive, though. I guess men in general are, are different, and he certainly was. He was very competitive, even with me. I don't. I mean, he didn't encourage me to write. I don't know if he was. Um, I don't think he was afraid I was going to beat him <laughs> or anything. Mm -hmm. But, but he uh, he didn't encourage it. Mm -hmm. So. I had to sneak around and write my Did first you really? Novel. Yeah. Did you really? Yeah. Yeah, the first time I, I was, when I met him, I was writing a novel. Mm -hmm. at, in college, I was finished up my degree. And um, I had about 100 pages. And finally, he knew I was doing it. Finally, he asked to read it. And I gave it to him. And he took it downstairs and came back up and said, uh, well, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be, which just you know, devastated me. So I put it in the drawer and didn't look at it for 20 years. And went on and painted and modeled and did all this. And I, you know, truly, I wasn't in a big rush to be a writer then because I was having too much fun doing all this other stuff. But um, what do you think that was about? What the novel? Now he is not being oh, encouraging. I don't think he liked the book very much. Uh -huh. It was it was my our styles are so different. I mean, you know, they're just diabolically different. Um, but anyway, he when I, the, the novel still kind of kept bouncing around in my head, and years later. We, he discovered that I really could write. We, did, we wrote three screenplays together, and uh, you know, not, not to bore you with the whole details, but uh, I started writing this novel without telling him because mm -hmm. I didn't want him to you know, knock it out of me again. Right. And uh, I finally let an agent read it, uh, who was a friend, before Norman read it, and the agent called me up at 11 o'clock at night and said, I'm assigning you to a contract. Go upstairs and get back to work. And wow. So. I, but I was afraid to let him read it, and finally it came out in galleys just the step before being published. And he said, I think it's time I read this book. And I was like, well, okay. So he took it upstairs, and I'm downstairs waiting, you know, hoping that he's going to like it. And he came down with this stack of papers and handed it to me, and he said, here, you put these changes in, and I'll work behind you. And I said, changes? You're editing my book? And I'm like, no, you're not editing my book. This is my book. Right. You know, it's not going to be our book. No. And he, and he said, well, if I can't edit, I can't read it. And I said, well, you read it when it comes out. In the course of your relationship with Norman, you got to model professionally. You published two novels. You got to act in the theater and in, was it in, in at least two movies, right? Yeah, a little part. Um, you directed a theater company. You co-wrote screenplays with him. You traveled all over the world. Would you have gotten to do, I mean, even with the same capabilities. Mm -hmm. Would you have gotten to do these things if you had not met him? been Norman Mailer's partner? Well, of course not. No. I would have done other things. I might have moved to, I had, I had, um, I'd applied to RISD. I'd applied to Mass Arts in Boston. I might have gone to Boston to graduate school. I might have met someone else. Uh, I mean, you know, the road not taken. There were so many roads not taken that could have been anything. I might have stayed in Arkansas. Um, I have no idea what would have happened. This is just what happened to me. So at some point, you've been together for a long time, you found out that he wasn't being faithful. Yeah. Um, I guess the question is, why, why would that come as a surprise? I know, you? I know. There was, there was the, you bought your ticket. How did right. You? Because when we got together, one of the things that he was so adamant about was he wanted to try a relationship with a woman based on monogamy. He had never, ever done that. He had been, he had cheated with every woman he had ever been with, starting with, you know, first girlfriend, I guess. And he wanted to see how deep a relationship could go if there was total fidelity. And I really, truly believe that for at least seven or eight years, he was true. I, I think he really gave it a, a good, good shot. Um, and then one day he didn't. And I guess it's the old seven-year itch, whatever it was, mm -hmm. um, you know. And and then I started finding out that it was, you know, kind of a lot. It wasn't right. just one person; it was a lot of them. We only got we got just a minute left. Oh but no! If uh, you had to do it over again, would you? Yes, I would, of course. 
I would. I, you know, in spite of everything, it's, I love the old coot. I really did. He was the most interesting man I'd ever met. He, uh, he was a great dad. He was, um, the kids all love him. You know, it was, it was a, it was a wild ride. I it was a circus, but it was a great it was show. A, it was a great show. Okay. <laughs> I wish you had more time. Very interesting book. Thank you so um, much, Cheryl. I want to thank <laughs> Norris Church Mailer for joining me today. A Ticket to the Circus, a memoir, has just been published by Random House for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.